troops under training in the bush. The latest Eritrean recruits about to take part in the province's bitter struggle for independence from Ethiopia. So far, their experience has been theoretical, but soon all that will change. For the war's hotting up, and the latest news is of a massive offensive launched by at least 20,000 Ethiopian troops, aircraft and tanks. Despite internal feuding between the various guerrilla movements, the Eritreans now claim to control 90% of the country and to have Ethiopian forces under pressure. The prize? Sun-baked thorn scrub, Eritrea's arid land. Not much to fight for unless it's your home and you've already put 17 years into the war. The present position is this. Eritrean guerrillas have forced the Ethiopians into two strongholds in the north, the capital Asmara and the town and port of Masawa, further up the coast. But the less territory Ethiopia holds, the more it can concentrate its forces, making the strategically vital Asmara an impenetrable power base. Five miles due west of Asmara itself, guerrillas of the Eritrean Liberation Front regularly replenish their meagre rations, bringing them in on foot because they have too little food and water to keep their mules going. The guerrillas don't complain as they make their way through the foothills in the searing heat, 130 degrees and no shade to give a moment's relief. Instead, they remind themselves that the Ethiopians are worse off. Rumors reaching the camp they've dug into the hillside tell of appalling shortages and disease inside the beleaguered capital. The stories are almost certainly true, for Asmara's only supply link with the outside world is an airborne one. Convoys of giant transport planes ferry in essentials, while the Eritreans keep up their blockade on the ground. The Eritreans can't hope to knock the Russian-supplied planes out of the air with their antiquated weapons. In fact, they rarely bother to try. None of the motley selection of guns on the slopes outside Asmara can open up fast enough to follow modern jets. Ethiopian forces control the air, and that's a key piece in the present state of checkmate. The honeycomb of hideouts is bombed every day. This peaceful looking landscape stands right in the path of the counterattack that the Ethiopian forces must make again sooner or later if they're to burst out of the Asmara trap. They've tried before and failed beaten by the terrain and guerrilla tactics, hamstrung without effective Cuban support, which made all the difference when the Ethiopian army won its recent victory in the Ogaden. Meanwhile, the peasants gather chilies. It's comparatively safe for people to work outdoors by day. Machinery, though, must stay under cover. A glint from the metal of a tractor or a lorry can be seen thousands of feet above by the pilot of a marauding MiG, enough to bring down a hail of shrapnel or a fiery flood of napalm. Instead, the tractors emerge at dusk when the risk is less, working through the safety of the night. This is just one way in which wartime Eritrea has become a nation of night people. With or without independence, the Eritreans are running the state for themselves, not only the war, but the agriculture and their education. Not surprisingly, the way things are, the best organized class here is first aid. At this training school, 150 teenagers at a time are given basic instruction in medicine and hygiene. After a two-month course, graduates go either to the front line as nurses or into the country as public health officers. It's part of the policy of the ELF, who divided their territory into 12 administrative areas to deal with all problems, social, political and economic, as well as military.
Another example of the ELF's approach, its systematic and single-minded effort to defeat an army much larger, better equipped, and more heavily supported than it can ever be. This is an ELF field garage, a make-do and mend center par excellence. It's much busier here at night. Then volunteers toil under arc lamps with welding gear to patch up bullet-ridden jeeps, cannibalizing engine parts and axles to revive precious trucks, working mechanical marvels to keep the war machine firing on all its cylinders. Not everything stops for war. Love goes on. But this wedding in Shamboko had to take place at night to escape the inevitable daytime air raids. Morale among the Eritreans is amazingly high. Only one topic causes dismay. The actions of Russia and Cuba, whom the Eritreans long regarded as their friends. Many people here simply can't believe that their former allies are now backing the Ethiopian enemy. Others cheerfully maintain that it's all a huge mistake and that the Russians will eventually make amends and return to support Eritrea. That's a view that may prove less far-fetched than it seems, for recent diplomatic leaks confirm that the ELF's leader, Ahmed Nasser, has been to Moscow for talks aimed at ending the war without involving the communist powers any deeper. Political worries are one thing, and for some, even the horror of war can be escaped for a while. But drive along the bucketing, unmade tracks of southwest Eritrea's lowlands south of Tessany, towards the border with Sudan. Here, another killer stalking the peasants. Six years ago, this was lush green fields, fed by the waters of the river Gash. Not anymore. The area is parched by three years of drought. Livestock has died, crops have perished, whole villages have disappeared, and life for the survivors centers on getting just a drop of water each day. Wells have to probe a hundred feet to gather the moisture below. Grateful villagers carry it for miles back to their families. The drought in these parts is an extension of that in the Sahel. There, relief flooded in, but not here. Eritrea's present political situation complicates the process of aid. So 16,000 people in 40 villages like Sozali are threatened with eventual starvation. Their only food, the ground up kernels of a semi-poisonous nut soaked in water to make it less bitter. It's simply not enough. Oblivious to all the suffering, by drought and by war, stands Haile Selassie, former Ethiopian emperor, now draped in a raincoat, overlooking the major town of Mendafera. The ELF took Mendafera last August, after 12 days of bloody fighting. It's a particularly strategic town, 20 miles southwest of Asmara itself, and 50 miles or so from the Ethiopian border. To look around, you wouldn't think that 40,000 Ethiopian troops were poised an hour's drive away. The people here have enough confidence in their freedom fighters to go about their business unruffled by that threat. The big danger to Mendafera comes not from the army, but from the air, and it comes with terrifying regularity. Whether the pilots are Cubans, South Yemenis, or Russian-trained Ethiopians, the havoc wrought by the MiGs on their deadly raids remains equally devastating. In April, 50 people were killed by the bombs. Since January, 200 dead, 400 wounded. The reminders abound in the mounds of rubble that were homes, shops, tea houses. 
An even grimmer memento, though, is this bomb casing, one which mercifully did not explode. It's an anti-personnel cluster bomb, presumably left over from the time when America backed Ethiopia. Small wonder the inhabitants of Mendafera stay close to their air raid shelters rather than put their faith in the pitiful old Ak Ak guns surrounding the town. This is the way that the Ethiopians are striking at civilian morale. The Russian supplied MiGs bomb every day without fail. Only the timing is changed. This time it was 4.40 in the afternoon. Only two bombs were dropped and one of those fell wide. It could have been a lot worse. It often has been. A primary school was hit. With no fire brigade or water, townsfolk threw earth to put out the flames. In this raid, no one was killed. But the previous week, bombs fell in the centre of town, killing 28 and injuring over 100 more. For such casualties, the chances of survival are poor. This tiny hospital, designed to take 45 patients, is now crammed with over 430. Bandages are in such short supply, they have to be sterilized and reused. There are no pain-killing drugs, a bare minimum of anesthetics. Cross-infection in the ward runs riot. It would be worse but for the dedication of Gebriab Mariam, a nurse they call doctor, a mark of respect, not a mistake. We lack medicines and we lack surgical instruments as well. Last time we had patients from air bombardment and the fighting, around 430 cases in this hospital. To give enough medicines, to give enough food, to give enough place to dress them, to give good care, it was almost impossible. However, we did manage it very good. In the fort at Mendafera are more pitiful inmates, this time Ethiopians, prisoners of war captured during the fall of the town. Now, though, there's no fight in them. How long have you been prisoners? One year. Here about uh, three months in Mendafera. Yes. But uh, generally, we have about a year we have done here. What do you think is going to happen to you in the end? In the end? <laughs> I hope that... Uh, in Jain or homeland. When Eritrea get their freedom, we have a chance to back our homeland. You want to go back to Ethiopia? Sure. So many people weary of the war. But that's not the story among the latest generation of freedom fighters. And in Eritrea, they start learning the facts of life and death very young. The bayonet practice of these 10-year-olds has a frightening realism. And as the war intensifies, more of these children are being drafted in to make sure the struggle will continue. This nocturnal passing out parade included one way that tested their fanatical dedication, sometimes with painful results. Youths who weren't born when the war began prepare to play their role. The children of Eritrea practice how to die so that their revolution may live. <laughs> 